you're outside, huh? I don't put my foot in my mouth. Uh, I'm not, yes. Yeah. It's a little cold. I have an extra layer on. Oh, that's um, nice. <laughs> but it's a full moon, obviously. Uh, yes, clearly. A couple of days ago. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. All right. We're almost at 6.30. So um, I just want to remind everybody that this is a two-part event. Um, so this evening we're joined by... Bruce will lead us in this virtual educational session. And Saturday at 10 a.m., we are going to go out in the field, and Bruce is going to take us out. Um, and we'll be meeting at, is that um, the Falls Campground Trailhead, Bruce? Yes, in the parking lot there, the pull-off at okay. uh, 10. Yep. Good. <clears throat> and I'll do a reconnaissance tomorrow. I know it's going to be Forecast is for 42 for a high on Saturday up there. <clears throat> but that won't happen until mid-afternoon. So it'll be reaching that point by the time we finish up. All right, splendid. And we are at 6.30 now, so I'll just um, okay. do a quick launch. Everybody, welcome to National Bighorn Sheep Center. Um, this event tonight, Reading Winter Tracks with Bruce Thompson. Um, for those of you who are local indie boys, you're very familiar with Bruce, um, who is an expert in this field. Um, I'll leave it up to Bruce to speak about his credentials, but there are many. Um, Bruce generously volunteers his, his time this evening, um, and we thank him. All of his work is benefiting the National Bighorn Sheep Center. Um, this is a two-part series, so for those of you who are interested, we're meeting Saturday at 10 a.m. at the Falls campground, uh, the, tr the parking lot there. If you need more information, um, send us a, an email and we will get it to you. Um, with that, I'll hand the reins over to, to Bruce. Bruce, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Thanks. Thank you for uh, joining me tonight for this. I appreciate it. I don't <clears throat> know how experienced you are, are with uh, tracking. I'll evaluate uh, whether I need to upload or download um, information <laughs> in greater or lesser degree uh, as as some of you ask questions or I, I see anybody nod off because I can see you all. Oh, okay. So far, so good. Okay. Um, wait, Karen, is that just a picture of you or are you just frozen? That, oh, she's got a picture of herself. Okay, that's good. She's just, that smile is just so permanent there. It's oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right, well, let's begin. Oh, so, yeah, background. Um, so I'm retired, um, lived in Salt Lake City for 18 years. I, well, going back, I guess, I was, uh, I worked for Teton Science Schools for eight years, and uh, some of those being director of education and others being a lead instructor uh, and then director of education there. I wrote science curriculum for biological sciences curriculum study in Colorado Springs under an NSF grant, uh, National Science Foundation. Um, <clears throat> ran a business, Ecotrax, ecology-based teaching resources and curriculum services out of Salt Lake for most of those times. And I had uh, mostly clients in the, in the Intermountain West. Um, I did do programs for a Smithsonian Institution and the California uh, Academy of Biodiversity uh, and a few other uh, national groups. Uh, but I tend to focus uh, on the, the places that I knew best, which tended to be in the Intermountain West. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me all right? Anyone not? Okay, good. All right, so, um, and tracking has been a passion for me. I, I, I um, picked up on that early on. I had an old girlfriend give me uh, Bolas Muri's uh, Peterson Field Guide to Animal Tracks um, many years ago many years ago, more than half a life ago. And, uh, and that uh, kind of got me started and then going to Teton Science School and uh, becoming friends with Jim Halfpen and he was doing tracking stuff. And I just <clears throat> latched onto that. And it's been a passion of mine ever since then. So I don't know, 30 years. Um, <clears throat> speaking of Jim, so uh, some, some good, guy oh, I guess I have to hold it this way. So some guides, uh, you can contact me or you can contact me through Sarah if you want, but this Falcon guide is nice because it's thin and pocketable, but it's got really good illustrations. 
of scat tracks, trails, range maps, and a little bit about the species. So that's really nice for a backpack kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> Jim Halfpenny also has uh, scat and tracks of North America, which is a bigger book, not particularly as good for field use, but it's a good reference back home. One of my favorites, though, Mammal Tracks and Signs by Mark Elbrock. I mean, this, this it's, it's on the heaviest possible paper you could possibly put a print a book on. So it's really not a field guide, but it's really a marvelous resource. He's done some amazing work. He also, uh, out of respect, only after Marty Murray passed away, did Mark get involved in uh, updating the uh, Olas Murray Field Guide Animal Tracks in the Peterson series. So this was now a companion project of uh, Mark and, uh, and Olas uh, uh, after Olas, of course, passed away in the 60s. Um, and then uh, Elbrock also has, I guess I already showed you this. Did I already show you this one? I think I did. Oh, and then Louise Forrest has a really nice, this is one specific to um, tracking animals in snow. I don't know if this is in print anymore, but this, is, this has been a nice resource to recommend as well. So <clears throat> I guess we all start, let's get tracking. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to, um, I guess, focus on um, track identification, but with, in the spirit of motivation for the stories that tracks tell you uh, as a way to, um, to take it easy with perhaps groups of animals, dogs and cats are a nice uh, pair to know how to distinguish and know how they distinguish themselves from other species in their tracks. And then you have the rodents group, uh, which distinguish themselves from other small critters like um, shrews, because they have different number of toes, and also some of the larger animals, such as our, our hooved ungulates. Uh, so we'll talk about that. So as we go along, <coughs> excuse me. I, um, I started a publication called Biolog back in the 80s uh, in association with Teton Science School. And um, Denise Casey, uh, who lives in Jackson, uh, I hired her to write, draw this for me. I wanted some kind of illustration that would sort of set the tone uh, for uh, a program, or a pub, in this case, it was a publication um, the, uh, for animal sign that's not just footprints and scat, it's all the other things that animals uh, leave behind or create as part of their lifestyle. And some of them depicted here in the under snow or subnivian environment, uh, such as uh, that's meant to be a grouse. We had a little miscommunication there because the that's actually a, a, a white bird and it should have been brown. But anyway, uh, and we have a pine marten underneath that log and we have some voles down underneath the snow tunnels. And the fox who can hear very well through snow uh, is listening to it up above. A bobcat chasing a snowshoe hare and some wolves chasing down <laughs> a moose and then a, a, a raptor in the sky. So, okay, so that was sort of the, some background as far as my interest in the subject. Looking at this, this illustration um, put together, I had an artist, I put together some uh, tracks and scat bandanas years ago, back in the 80s, when I was transitioning from Teton Science School and thought I'd take advantage of this opportunity to start marketing this. So, um, and these are illustrations that I had an artist two artists actually in Salt Lake City draw for me based on photographs that I provided and um, shows the array. And so in looking at this for our purposes, I'm, I'm suggesting you look at this, we're thinking about or observing how some of these tracks are more similar to others close to them and more dissimilar to others farther away. Um, and if you look, start at the lower left, you'll see uh, a uh, mountain lion track next to a wolf track, those two lower left ones, one with claws, one without, uh, one oval in overall shape, one rounded, um, one with very symmetrical toes and one with somewhat asymmetrical toes. So those are kind of, those kinds of things I'm tossing out, not for you to attempt to remember, but 
the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about are distinguishing them. If you move to the right of the wolf tracks in the lower left with the claws, uh, you've got a beaver and that's a rodent and rodents have pretty much four toes in the front and five in the back, as opposed to dogs and cats that have four in the front and four in the back. So counting toes is one of the first things you learn to do when you're looking at tracks. Eventually some of the other traits that are more subtle uh, be, permeate your memory and uh, aren't necessarily a matter of counting toes. And if you go off to the right farther, you've got a bear with five toes front and rear. In the upper right, a skunk, five toes front and rear, because that's a mustelid. Members of, members of the weasel family, of which the skunk is one, have five toes front and rear. And in the lower right, just below that grizzly track are teeny little tracks of a shrew, also five toes front and rear. And hooved animals, we'll be talking a little bit about those as well. Um, if you look also to the top center, that's a raccoon. It's in its own family and it's fairly distinct from all the other species, but five toes front and rear as well. So let's look at foot evolution just insofar as again, get, uh, keeping in mind uh, what are the things that have happened since the primitive mammal, the earliest mammals, on uh, the terrestrial mammals on earth uh, began, they tended to have the most rodent-like foot. They had five digits uh, front and rear and an elongated foot like this, elongated digits. From that have evolved over time, the five-toed animals, including the bear, but not limited to, uh, the four-toed animals, including the cougar, and others, and then the hooved animals that can either have two in the case of a pronghorn or actually four toes with two elevated in the case of deer, elk, and moose. So we look at, we're talking about digital pads. So the digital pads have maintained uh, throughout evolutionary time from this primal, prim, uh, primitive mammal. It's just that the ungulates have encased the soft tissue of their toe tips with hardened fingernail material, or what we call hooves. They also have on their, and their, the, those two hooves are the equivalent. If you hold your hand out, your ring finger and your middle finger are what those toe, two, two toes are left over from the five-toed ancestry of even deer. And the two little dots behind are the pinky and index finger equivalent. And if you wanted to, you can even maneuver your, your hand in a way to almost make kind of a uh, shape of, of an ungulate. Noticing that just like the deer uh, digits, number, uh, number two and number five, they're elevated up the foot. Even the way we hold our hands, our fingers are shorter and we can simulate that as well. Uh, let's see. Intermedial pads, because of the plantar pads or intermedial pads. So on many rodents and possum and some other uh, critters, those intermedial pads are still individuated, individuated into five pads. But if you look to the right, the cougar, those have bumps suggesting an ancestry that perhaps had individual uh, intermedial pads, but they fuse together because this animal is only walking on two, four toes to lengthen the leg over time. And they do have the dew claw, the thumb equivalent on dogs and cats is elevated up the foot, still has a claw in most cases. Some people declaw dogs, domestic dogs and cats, but their ancestry still shows the leftovers from their five-toed ancestry. And on the top, we talked about the deer, and then down the bottom, uh, bears, uh, and members of the weasel family have retained their five toes, but they've, in the case of the bear, they fused those intermedial pads into basically the balls of their feet, as we would call them. Uh, and the proximal pad is that heel pad that does not show, although it is remnant. If you look at your domestic dog, they've got a remnant heel pad still there, but it's elevated up the foot, up the leg. So it's vestigial. Basically it hasn't, it, it, since it wasn't uh, uh, 
a negative factor in the survival of the evolution of certain species like dogs and cats, some of these vestigial parts still remain on the body but don't do anything anymore. I guess it's kind of like an appendix. So uh, again, getting back to just continuing this first basic part of our uh, program, uh, I wanted to show you again how um, we've got those groups we just looked at, but I'm delineating them slightly different here. So what the term used for the animals that walk on a full foot, including the heel, uh, are walking plantigrade, plantigrade motion. And a, not a term you have to know, but for those of you interested, they're walking on a full foot. Those walking on their toes or digits are digitigrade, and those include uh, the snowshoe hare, rabbits and hares at the bottom, and uh, members of the dog family in the center moving up above the rabbit, and then at the very top, uh, the cats, including the cougar, which is illustrated here. And then on the center column, you then have bison at the bottom, and gula grade bison. Uh, that next one is a pronghorn antelope. They do not have dew claws, and you can distinguish their tracks if they're sinking in mud or other substrate. Uh, you won't see the two dots of those number uh, number four and number, I'm sorry, number two and number five digits that we talked about um, that, that act as dew claws to the top one in the center, that's uh, a deer. So pronghorn, for their they're such fleet animals, they have eliminated all unnecessary baggage that does not serve their survival and allows them to move as quickly as 55 or 60 miles an hour. And they've gotten rid of the dew claws. They don't need them because they live on the plains. The dew claws are only useful in snow or substrate because if their foot sinks down, those dew claws still do help support weight once they make contact with the surface. The illustration on the right shows anatomically sort of what the skeletal structure looks like then and what parts of the animal's foot are making contact with the ground. Badger on the right, which is, I'm sorry, on the left of that tr triad uh, is plantigrade, full foot contact. The coyote in the center is showing digitigrade walking on digits. And then the deer uh, illustrates uh, where those parts of the leg fall out uh, in terms of walking on toenails. All right. Okay. I'm going to do a little dog and track thing here because I think the most fun uh, for beginning trackers is to distinguish dog and cat tracks. They share the same habitat, these wild canids and wild felids. And so, um, and it's, it's a pretty easy thing to grasp. And I think that once you get used to thinking about the distinction between dogs and cats, you're on the road to uh, distinguishing uh, lots of other uh, tracks of other family groups of mammals uh, that are different in their differences, but have sort of a, a mental compartment in a similar way that I'm going to uh, describe to you now. So one of the things you see here, uh, uh, we'll go through this, is the shape. Dog tracks, members of the dog family, are rectangular or they are longer than they are wide. Cat tracks are as wide or wider than they are long. So they're square or sometimes even flattened square, such as this cougar track here. In both cases, their thumb is elevated, so it's only from the right to the left, the number two index finger equivalent, number three middle finger, number four ring finger, number five pinky that they're walking on. Another difference is what's called the canid X. The way the uh, distribution of toes is on the, the canid foot or the dog foot is such that you could make lines to form an X that do not touch a toe. You can't do that with cats. They're they have a much wider plantar pad. It's, you'll notice it's bilobed, has two bumps on it there, that big pad at the bottom. And those other toes are oriented in a flatter or a less, uh, a less arcing uh, configuration. Same two, three, four, and five digits, uh, but the distinction is you can't make the X. They have a lead toe. Notice the number three toe is lead. You can actually tell a cat's 
left or right paw, just like if you hold your own right paw out, your uh, middle finger, the number three digit on your hand, extends farther out, most, most homo sapiens do, farther out than the other digits. This is also true of cats. The number three digit extends, and I could have exaggerated a little more, but it's, it's subtle in this illustration, um, than the dogs. Dogs are very symmetrical and the cats less so. Presence of claws, big distinction. Now you will see cat claw marks sometimes in snow or in soft substrate if they're having trouble getting a purchase on the ground, they're climbing up a hill or it's slippery, the claws will come out, but they are so thin and so unworn based compared to dogs that um, they're distinguished by looking like toothpick marks rather than a wider, more robust claw mark such as um, the dogs. Lead toe, there it is. Bilobed instead of a uh, single lobe at the tip of the plantar pad. And the other trait that was kind of, I found very interesting when I first noticed it is in relief, the, the toes and the pad, all the pads are pushing down and depressing the snow or the substrate, whatever it is. Uh, but because nothing's pressing on, if you look at the dog, nothing's pressing on the center between the toes that is actually rised up like a pyramid in relief in the track. Not so with a cat track. And this is especially noticeable in snow. Uh, the cats do have a little boomerang shaped, uh, ex uh, elevated uh, mass of snow in their tracks that doesn't get compressed, uh, but it sure isn't a, a, a boomerang. It's more of a musk ox horn. <laughs> And that's it. So the shape of the track, the X you can make with a dog track, the presence of claws or absence, the lead toe on cats, the plantar pad lobes being double lobed uh, on the cat, and in substrate relief, such as we just talked about, when they press down, what's left sticking up can be diagnostic. And that's, that's, even, that's even handier for older tracks when some of the other information from snow melt or melt freeze changes those uh, lifted substrate uh, indicators can be handy. Okay. Um, I don't think people, um, let's see, Sarah, do people have their, uh, don't have their microphones on, right? We don't have sound on? That's correct. They can unmute themselves if okay. they do have a question. All right. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to give you a few seconds to see which ones, which tracks each of you might, just to yourselves, which ones you do recognize. And um, pause for a moment. Some of them we've already looked at. So if we start from the uh, bottom left again, so you can see we saw this illustration before. So we have the the cat, the feline tracks, which in this case is a mountain lion on the lower left, to its immediate right, wolf tracks. Going farther to the right, there's our beaver, five toes in the back, four in the front. It's a rodent, it's a large rodent. To the right of that is an otter, river otter. The hint would be, first of all, which family, what's the largest family with five toes? It's the weasel family, the Mustelidae, and Otters are a member of the weasel family, and because they swim, they have webbed feet on their hind foot, as shown in this illustration. Notice also the odd thing about weasels compared to uh, a lot of other animals um, is that they have a bigger uh, front foot, and they even have a heel pad on their front foot that shows in a clear track. A whole different family history. To the right of that, we have our grizzly bear. If we go just above to the right of the grizzly bear in the center, that's a red squirrel. It's a rodent, four toes in the, back, uh, in the front, which are at the bottom, and five toes in the back, which are at the top, because their hind feet overstride past their front feet when they hop. We'll get to that later. 
just to the left and up a slight bit, we've got the uh, toes of a mouse, again, a rodent. The tinier toes in the, in the back are four digits and then the larger five digit hind feet right there, just above the beaver. Let's go all the way to the top. And there's, uh, again, we talked about the uh, raccoon. Uh, to the left of our mouse, just to the upper left of the big beaver track, our pronghorn antelope, no dew claws. Their tracks are, now sometimes if the substrate's really hard, you won't see dew claws in a deer track either. So the distinguishing trait though is the shape of the claws, uh, the, the, uh, the hooves. In the case of mule deer, they're often said to have a heart-like or upside down heart-like shape. Whereas the pronghorn antelope has an elongated pair of hooves with a dent. If you look carefully, there's sort of an indentation toward the center on the left and right side, a little pucker. That's characteristic of pronghorn antelope. To left of the pronghorn are four-toed front and rear uh, 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 snowshoe hare, four toes front and rear rabbits and hares, and on the top left is a bison. All right, start moving along, there we are. Okay. Let's talk about patterns now. So you look at feet, sometimes you only get a track or two and you can't tell the pattern that was being used by the animal. But a lot of times in snow, you can't see much of the foot. It's just a mark, it's just a hole in the snow that left because it's powder, soft powder especially, is very uh, uh, annoying to work with for looking for tracks, uh, foot detail in tracks. But patterns are pretty easy to see. And one of them is this pattern, which should look somewhat similar to your own walking pattern, even though you only have two legs that touch the ground. And this particular animal is a quadruped, is, is walking with four. I'm showing the four. Uh, the gray track underneath is the front foot and then the hind foot lands on top and that's in blue. But it's a left, right, left, right pattern. And even though they, all, they have twice as many feet as we do, they can make tracks like us because they direct register their hind foot into the same place the front foot had been when they're walking when they're trotting or loping or galloping, not so, or when they're walking really slowly, not always, but in general, and especially in the winter, because who wants to post hole four times with four legs if you can have your hind feet go in the same hole pre-made by the front feet, energy saving. Okay, next we have the hoppers. And so hoppers include uh, most medium or small rodents, uh, beavers don't hop. <laughs> they are a large rodent, too big. Um, but also rabbits and hares, uh, voles, mice, chipmunks, ground squirrels. So rodents and lagomorphs, so rodents and, and members of the rabbit and hare family. We'll look at some differences, some subtle differences though, between some of those families, even though they're all hopping. And then we have these guys, and these are the ones that are going two by two. And again, you'll notice that in an energy efficient form of motion, which isn't their only way of moving, but the ener energy efficient two by two makers uh, will also direct register. That is to say their hind feet landing in the same place their front feet had been. So the two by two offset, and that's, that's important too. Two by two offset is diagnostic for the members of the uh, uh, weasel family, Mustelidae. All right, there are variations on those walkers. So you got the coyote on the left in a normal walk with a direct registration, the darker gray hind foot in the illustration landing on top of the lighter gray front foot. Direction to travel in snow or on soft substrate is often indicated by the comet tail behind. This works really well for snow. So you look for the drag mark. They, they want to lift their foot straight out so they don't impede forward motion when they're moving forward. 
but they'll slide the foot into the next track, leaving the comet tail if the snow is any deeper than an inch or two. On the right is another walker, and with kids I'd call them fatties. They're just big, uh, lumbering, slow-moving walking animals, which include porcupines, beavers, and badgers. They tend to be pigeon-toed as well, and they also tend to drag. So there's, a, there's, there's clues right there, even from a distance. You see a pigeon toad, you see dragging, you're looking at an animal that, in other words, is at home someplace other than on the ground. In the water like a beaver, uh, and perhaps underground like a patcher, and up in a tree like a porcupine. They're not skilled runners. They have other things protecting them, such as quills on a porcupine. So we'll add some of these vari variables here then. Uh, so we have then a variation on our zigzag walker uh, that we looked at first, such as our coyotes and uh, dog and cat families. Uh, and then we have our fatties or our pigeon toed uh, kind of slow walkers, uh, which would be uh, the, the beaver, the porcupine, and the badger. Who's? Yes. I've got a question. On yes. the tail, is that point? That isn't pointing the direction of, of, of travel, is it? No, that's no. And that would be nice if it was with <laughs> arrow. No, sure that's, that's dragging going in. Dragging it, okay. And you know, and, and actually, um, I don't think I included it, but when you, you know, if, if we get any more snow, when you're walking in snow, you're, you'll see that you leave the yeah. same comet tail going into your track, because right. you drag going in, but you lift right. out going forward. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Yeah, ch chime in anytime, anyone. Uh, okay, so the hoppers also have variation then. The biggest distinction is tree climbing hoppers tend to place their front feet side by side directly behind their hind feet. They almost look like two exclamation points. And that, I presume, never found this in literature, but it makes sense when I watch a squirrel run across the ground and leap into the tree, wouldn't it make more sense if the first things that hit the tree are two front feet grabbing it with all the claws instead of just one and risking hanging. And so since they are tree climbing animals, be side by side with your front feet makes sense. So that's a distinguishing thing. So you can start with the group of hoppers, which has a big hind foot, small front foot, and the hind foot passes the front feet. Direction to travel is up for both of these, All right? So where the hind feet are relative to the front and where the front feet place themselves, whether it's side by side, you know, parallel or offset. And that tells tree climber versus not. Um, and this is kind of fun to look at. Um, I mean, I, okay, I'm telling you it's fun. I think it's fun. I'm just going to share my own bias. But in this illustration, um, I, I can use my mouse, can I? I just realized that. So I've illustrated, you can see my mouse, right? Yes, good. Um, so I've labeled where the left front and right front and the right hind. Now the left hind is also obviously on this animal, but it's hidden because it's on the other side of the body. So here's the placement. So essentially the uh, left front, which has already hit the ground and is over here, uh, it's already making ready for its next movement. And then here's the second, the right front foot here. And then these two hind feet are parallel to one another, meaning they're gonna land at the same time and they come forward and make that mark. So that's sort of the anat anatomical purpose or reason that they leave the tracks they do. Okay, so um, we can also then add another, the other type of hoppers then. We have our offset front feet for the terrestrial hoppers, and this would include mice and voles as well as rabbits and hares. It would include uh, chipmunks and, uh, and so forth. The tree climbing Tree climbing hoppers will uh, instead leave these more exclamation mark side by side front 
and rear. Uh, another variation I want to talk to, so most members of the weasel family are doing this, what's called a bounding pattern as opposed to a walking. Walking is left, right, zigzag. Bounding is the whole body leaves the ground in almost a diving arc, comes down, front feet uh, hit the ground first, hind feet then follow. And it's hard to imagine, it's almost like a gymnast. <laughs> You're pretty much making your body into almost a complete circle for a brief moment. Uh, the benefit of that I'll talk about later too, because when you arch the back in that movement, the back acts like a spring so that when they leave, launch forward, the spring unfolds. Like if you've ever bent a spring and let go of it, you, you hurt yourself, but it'll just move forward. A lot of energy in a tense backbone of an elongated animal, such as members of the weasel family. Uh, so the, the weasels will do the two by two direct registration but because they're such lean uh, and energetic animals, they can also do this upper track here where the front feet land and the hind feet pass them. Similar to what rabbits and hares do, but among the weasel family, they're pretty unique in being able to do that. They tend to leave a drag mark between them because the front feet are landing and the hind feet are gonna land so soon thereafter, they're really close to the ground and in snow will often leave a drag mark. And so for that reason, they're often called dumbbell tracks. That's characteristic of weasels. I put this in there not to add confusion, although it might, uh, but I wanted to point out that all of these animals that we've been talking about have the dominant pattern that we're talking about, the two by two offset, the zigzag left and right, and the two small feet, two hind feet hopping patterns. All of those animals when moving quicker or uh, moving under different terrain can leave a different track. So for example, with our weasel family, the two by two bound is the slower but most energy efficient form of motion. So 90% of the time this animal is gonna be doing, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, am I there? Where did I go? Oh, here we go. Um, is going to be doing this kind of movement, the two, two by bound, two X, two by bound. Um, but the four by lope, when they, when they move, now weasels don't do this very much. What weasels do when they're really cooking is they'll do that overstride where the hind feet pass their front feet because they're such small, nimble mammals. But the other larger, medium size uh, bounders will go into a lope uh, so for example, a pine marten could do this. That's in the weasel family. And you can see I made the front feet light gray and the back feet dark gray. You can see how the, the spacing of toes for the four by lope of uh, a um, uh, pine marten, for example, or a mink, so medium size. Uh, and then there's the one, two, one lope here. That's the fastest form of, of movement generally that they're going to use. And that's where the two uh, front feet land first and the two hind feet, this one certainly passes and this one often passes slightly the front feet. So it's really getting, when hind feet pass the front, they really have momentum. And so this is the, the one, two, one uh, lope pattern, okay? So when you see that, I'm telling you this, not so much that you try to learn this now, if you don't already know it, but that, you're going to be following tracks and they'll look like this and then they may change like these. Or better yet, you come across tracks like these, like the lope, the four by lope or the one, two, one lope, and you go, who is this? That is an energy expending form of locomotion. Consequently, if you're in winter, snow country, they're gonna slow down and reveal their truth selves with a two by two pattern. So confused at first, read the rest of the story. Don't just read the first page, you know, read the chapter and you're gonna probably find yourself uh, getting identification clues that you didn't have earlier. Okay, what do we have next here? What am I doing? Oh yeah, so there I just add that overstride uh, form of motion from bounding mammals. In this case, 
pretty much, I've only maybe once saw a, uh, a Pine Martin doing that. And I, he just didn't know better. He wasn't supposed to do that. Okay. All right. What do we got next, Bruce? Well, let's see. I got a blank screen. Hmm. Oh yeah. Why did I leave this on? I meant to take, well, this is kind of nice. Let's just, let's just have a little poetic moment here, shall we? I, 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 have, a, I have a romantic relationship with winter and snow because I just love tracking. So the great revealer that can't keep a secret all through the woods around us was filled with the gossip of the night. Here's, here's the gossip of the night. Because so many tracks are made in the evening or uh, early morning hours. So from here on, we're going to go into phase two. Oh, and incidentally, look at those tracks there. So the ones in the foreground at the bottom, those are weasels. It's two by two offset. If you look like right here at this one, you can kind of see there's actually two feet there. We have a squirrel going across here, a sloppier track. Sloppy tracks indicate an animal at home someplace other than on the ground. Here is a pine marten, two by two offset, much bigger than the weasel, but in the weasel family. Here's a fast moving weasel doing the dumbbell. Front foot lands, hind foot overstrides. Another weasel, and then crap loads of weasels here. So a lot of weasels in this area. But I, I like this, this picture because I was happening to be coming back from tracking and I saw this, I said, oh, wait a minute. And an old moose track. Yes, and an old moose track even coming down this way, going up. Okay. Am I getting too excited? <laughs> okay, all right, this, <clears throat> I took this picture outside a cabin I was staying in one time. And this, uh, this shows pretty much the smallest animal whose tracks you're gonna find in winter and the largest, side by side. And this is, well, let's see, I can probably reveal this, okay, right. All right, so <clears throat> a uh, shrew, and up above uh, the moose. And I even followed the track and found, and I thought this was just poetic, that the shrew went inside of the track of the moose. Small meets large. Poetry and tracks. Ah, here's my feet. So I'm showing you uh, a boot track. So you can see in the normal walking, Two things to notice here, because this is again a clue to direction of travel. Direction of travel is good if either you want to catch up to the animal or it's an animal species you don't want to catch up to. Um, so here you have snow spray in the front. Snow gets kicked forward and the drag mark in the back. Most mammals other than me <laughs> don't leave such a huge drag mark there. I think I was exaggerating for, for the photo, but um, anyway. So the snow spray and the drag mark uh, from motion. This picture here, so I, uh, this is when I was working at the science school. So I'm up with skis and you can see that my ski poles are doing the same thing feet do. They show snow spray in the front and the drag mark in the back. So you can tell a skier's direction to travel in the same way. Over here, coming again, well, I'll let, let you, ponder for a moment which direction of travel you have with this animal. It's a very narrow stride, a straddle. Straddle is the width across between the outside of the left foot across to the outside of the right foot. This is a good indication of a wild walking animal as opposed to a domestic. Very narrow, it's almost a straight line. Domestic, very few domestic dogs can do that. Uh, but direction of travel then is indicated by the comet tail. Can you all see the comet tails that show up? So that's the drag mark going in. So you know, and a, not a lot of snow spray, but a little bit, but mostly the drag mark going in, a little bit of drag coming out in a few places, but predominantly big drags in the back. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just counter, countered, uh, yeah. Nope, sorry. It is moving toward us. Look at this guy though. All right, don't look at the bottom. Uh, so here we have, this animal is actually dragging going in and a little bit out. So you have to go back here. The best view is right here. 
in the middle section where the drag, the comet tails and the snow spray. So sometimes you have to walk along the length of a trail for a while to see what the preponderance of evidence says as far as direction of travel. This was really deep powder. So in deep powder, you're gonna get some dragging going on in both directions. Okay, so coyote, coyotes are really fun to, to, uh, to track, to follow. And again, read a page, read a chapter, read a book. Those are all increments of how you can really learn more about tracking. If you pick an animal, I used, to, I still like to go out and I'm open to the idea of finding an animal whose tracks are fairly fresh and deciding for the next hour, I'm going to adopt that animal and follow it. And that's what I did this particular day. These are coyote tracks. And this is classic coyote behavior, walking along the edge. He's between two habitat types and it likes food from both. So this is like being in a supermarket with an aisle where you've got small mammals living in the sage grassland here. And down here, you might have a struggling deer or some other animals that are in a river bottom. Uh, that would be, so you got two different, so you double the amount of possibilities. So go ahead and <clears throat> doing this, and this would be, this would be uh, territorial. This would be the territory of this particular coyote. If you came back in two weeks and found the tracks, so you could be pretty sure it's the same coyote. Uh, this is coyote sign. I got a little illustration up here to remind us. Um, this is a place where it dug down almost three feet deep to find fish remains right here on the center right, where my cursor is. That, see the fish bones? So otters had left fish remains on the shore here long before the snow covered it all up. The coyote with an incredible nose can smell through two or three feet of snow and smell fish remains, dug them up, and, and had some of the leftovers that the otters didn't eat. Other behavior from coyotes. On the left, <clears throat> this is, we're in, well, we're in early March now. In February, the coyotes start pair bonding. Males and females get together and will spend the next several weeks together in a, uh, uh, courtship behavior, and they'll follow each other. These sloppy tracks here that might look like some animal, some drunken animal, was actually two coyotes, the male and the female, that then switched off and went in two different directions because they were hungry and they realized, save energy here in the early part, split the habitats, you're more likely to find food by going in different directions later on. Uh, over here is a coyote den, so shelters underneath uh, dead fallen trees, for example, is a place <clears throat> that uh, you can sometimes follow tracks to. All right. One of these pictures is of a wild canid, and it's on the left. And one of these pictures is of a domestic canid on the right. Big difference, right? So the one on the right has guaranteed food, in most cases, waiting back home, and is considerably overweight from the standpoint of a coyote. Uh, coyote, look how narrow that is. There's hardly even a left-right zigzag to their, uh, to their left or right movements. Very narrow. Uh, and in fact, what's amazing about this picture, the reason I took it originally, this is a bonded pair, male and female. A little mistake there, see the extra foot? That wouldn't happen with one animal. And up here, they split off and go in two different directions. So real energy if each of them put one foot almost in front of the other. What incredible balance. Let's hear it for the coyotes. Okay. Here I have uh, <clears throat> illustrated with the arrow, a coyote track, uh, actually several going back and forth in different directions. Also in this picture are much larger tracks these here, and those belong to another canid. Again, notice how narrow the straddle is. 
it almost looks like it could have been a hopping mammal, but it's not. This is a wolf. Uh, this was in Jackson Hole just after, with the first winter that wolves made it down from Yellowstone into Jackson Hole. This is up behind Teton Science School. So you can see the incredible difference in size from a distance uh, between coyotes and, and wolves. There's my glove um, next to a wolf track. You see how large a wolf track is. Um, again, you can see the symmetrical feet of it. You can see that that plantar pad at the bottom uh, is a single point, Sy symmetrical toes, Claws probably made marks, but this is powder, so they're not showing. And just a, a little bump here, the pyramid sticking up here. A little harder to see with a photograph looking straight down. And there's a wider view of my glove and the size of the tracks. Uh, on the left side, uh, <laughs> so on the extreme left here is the wolf track. And these are my boot tracks. So that's a big foot. I'm wearing, that's a size 11 boot going parallel to this wolf. Direction of travel, you can see the snow spray here. But this, this wolf, of course, they have such long legs. They're um, lifting their foot up so far, you're not even getting a comet tail like you would with a coyote. The snow here was probably 12, 15 inches deep. Okay, here we have coming toward us, a coyote. Hopefully now you're getting used to recognizing coyote tracks, the size of the foot, um, and which is maybe uh, sm smaller than a tennis ball, somewhere between a golf and a tennis ball, elongated, and their straddle is so narrow. But it's not a hopping animal, and the one way you can tell that is it's, 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 it's not a straight line but it's really a narrow straddle. At the bottom, we have <clears throat> this animal, and it is a more rounded track, and it's a larger track. And I don't have a close-up to show you, but um, so this is a cougar. This is a, a mountain lion track here, uh, about twice the size if we look straight down at it. I'll show you some more later. Um, so this was, uh, they were, the cougar track was, I would estimate, a day or two older. I can't remember what the weather was like or the temperature. Temperature ages the track uh, faster if it's warmer. And if it's in the single digits or teens, it, it can look, it could look less old than a day old track in the sun after a week uh, if, it's this, if it's cold snow. So <clears throat> anyway, um, I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh yeah, okay. So there's there's a close up of the uh, the cougar track, and again, you can see now. Can anyone want to uh, speculate which foot is this? Because there's the lead toe. Hmm. So this is the right foot, just like your lead toe is number two from the left. Uh, again, you, you, and you've got that nice bilobing, or again, it's powder, so the bilobing doesn't always show, but look how wide that is. That definitely isn't made by a single lobe. And that's a pretty large lens cap there, so that's a pretty good foot size. These are tracks um, I took in Washington State when I was doing a class there. Um, and you can see, a tr this is a great trotting track. And we're not gonna, walking is what I really want most to come out of this because uh, trotting you can pick up along the way, <clears throat> just practice. But this is a nice trotting example that I like. Uh, you can see that the front foot down here of a, a mountain lion is the bigger and wider. The hind foot is smaller. Front foot, although got a little powder in here, that's the front foot, bigger and wider, hind foot, smaller. So in a trot, what's happening is the hind foot of the same side of the animal, because of their forward motion, moves ahead of the front in each case. And that's a trot. And where would we be without scat? So this is a cougar 
dropping, scat dropping. It tends not to have a taper, although this one did. I think because I found out later on what this particular cougar was eating. It was feeding on a, well, it probably took down a deer, but ingested some of the fur. What you will find though in cougar scat rarely is bones. You open up a scat that could be a dog or a cat. If it's got a lot of bones, it's gonna be a wolf or a coyote or a fox. The absence of bones is a good indication of a cat. And I, this is that same cat. So I followed this cat for several miles and I found a place where suddenly it, I uh, was dra dragging, I found a, a, the kill site, it was dragging this animal. So here's the, here's the footprints of this uh, mountain lion uh, 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 dragging this heavy load. And this was a, a moose, it was a moose calf. Um, and it had, this is mostly just bones and fur at this point, but it spent a few days here evidently. That's my hand. And there's something different about this track, although I'm sure some of you are noticing this wide plantar pad here. So this is a cat. It's got a lead toe. Uh, and, but it's really small. So this is a smaller cat. It's a bobcat. And it's a bobcat that Now, I don't recall this track. This is several years ago. Uh, I'm trying to figure out if this is direct registration. I don't think so. I think this is the hind foot. So this was moving along in a trot, front foot, and then hind over striding it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. There's our bobcat. This is, a, a long, this is in Utah along um, a river whose name I forget. But it's interesting to see this bobcat was like, uh, was, 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 was trotting along. It was doing a direct registration trot. We know it's trotting because, um, oh, something I neglected to mention. Oh, darn, let's go back here. Let's see if I can go back. Maybe not. Ah. Okay, good, right. So left, here's the left foot of this cougar, right foot of the cougar, left foot of the cougar, right foot. This distance from a left foot to the next left foot is its stride. Stride of a walking animal is remarkably <clears throat> similar, although not identical, but extremely similar, similar and sometimes identical to its rump to shoulder length. So when you're looking at a direct registration walk, all you have to do is draw an outline in an oval between those feet and between the left foot, there's the right foot, and the next left foot, and you're looking like an aerial view of that animal's body size rump to shoulder. That's a real handy way to distinguish uh, which member of the cat family or dog family you're looking at. Now I'm gonna jump ahead here, back to where we were. Sorry about that omission. Okay. This is much longer than the body length of a bobcat, but there was only one print in each place and a few places there was a little somewhat sloppiness. And so uh, it, was, it was trotting but it didn't want to exert itself with all four feet going in different places. So it paced itself in a way that the hind foot while trotting uh, landed in the same hole as the front foot, but made a much longer than body length because uh, this really would be the straddle. I'm sorry, the stride would be here. This would have to be the length of this bobcat. And you can see by the hand scale, no bobcat is that long. Cats tend to have a wider stride, um, or I'm sorry, their strides tend to have a wider straddle across. You'll notice that this is not nearly as one foot in front of the other as our coyote earlier was. It's still a narrow straddle, but not as narrow. 
So this is getting about a, a three and a half uh, four inch uh, straddle. And um, <clears throat> so that's just uh, something to also, I also noticed it was dragging going in and out because it's a smaller animal. Um, I think that's all I have to say on that one. And I, so I'm following this bobcat along the river shore. I mean, they love to hunt along the river again, just like that coyote earlier that had the river down below and the uh, sage grassland above. This animal has a similar situation. It's near a river, but it also has uh, trees and shrubs. So it's got uh, two menus to choose from. Uh, on the right, <clears throat> you can see that this bobcat had caught a small rodent for dinner and it was hanging out of the left side of its mouth. And every time it took a step, it bounced the animal into the snow, its, its hind quarters. So now I'm following two animals, two mammals. So I wanted to follow that a little bit and see if I could find where it had, had lunch, but I didn't. Okay, so here again, we have uh, a trot, small foot, big foot, small foot, big foot, small foot, big foot, okay? So this front foot, there's the right front, there's the left front, here's the right hind and left hind. So again, bigger foot, front foot. Here also, now this is a slow moving animal. And I'm showing you this again, going off of my general rule of only doing walking patterns. So you can see that foot size will let you know what the pace is. This is actually a slow walk. The hind foot didn't even come up to the point of the front foot. It landed behind it. In this case, it landed in front of it. That's a fast moving, actually that's a trot. But this is a slow walk. And because it, it was on crust, didn't have to worry about saving energy from sinking in too deeply. It was just going slow, perhaps because it was sniffing and looking around because it was hunting. Okay, on the left is a bobcat. And on the right is a much larger cat um, that has a foot uh, size, two and a half times the size. So this is a, a, a lynx. This is the first lynx I tracked in Jackson Hole back when the Park Service and anyone else in Jackson Hole said lynx do not exist in Jackson Hole. <laughs> so, uh, and this is 1988. They weren't officially considered uh, a, an occupant of Jackson Hole until 1996 or 98. So I found this, um, here's the hind foot, here's the front foot, hind foot down here, front foot there. Their feet are very thickly furred for insulation, also giving a little bit more surface area for walking on snow. But consequently that fur tends to have snow cling to it. And the clinging snow on the front of the fur exaggerates the track. That's just snow making those extra marks. The anatomy of, of lynx is just phenomenal. Look at those over, over length legs. I mean, just remarkable. Very well adapted to snow country. Much better adapted than a bobcat. Okay, so here's some more. So I was following this uh, lynx tracks for a while. And, and um, yeah. Uh, these tracks are coming toward us, as you can see by the toe array. You can also see it's a trot. Here's the front foot, hind foot, front foot, hind foot, front foot, hind foot, smaller foot. But notice here, so what was happening here is this was out where the sun had been shining the day before. I'm out there in the morning, there's no sun here at all. But you could tell where the shade line was because this didn't get any sunlight on it. The snow stayed a really strong, firm crust. Here it didn't. This poor, uh, Lynx was sinking in with its front feet. The front feet are bigger because they carry more weight, but even though they're bigger, they still are bearing more weight that sinks in. They have the skull, the brain, the teeth, and uh, the neck and all, and, and all the other part of the animal that's much heavier in the front, hence the bigger feet in the front. All right, these are not cat tracks. So here I wanted to show you um, just differences between our three uh, most common ungulates other than, well, it's also pronghorn, but um, 
we're looking at moose at the top and in the center elk and in the bottom uh, uh, mule deer. And as you look at these, you'll see a distinction there how the elk foot is more rounded or less elongated. They all have dew claws, as you can see. So basically, if this was your hand, again, you're looking at index finger, uh, ring, uh, middle finger, ring finger, pinky, right? And so that's that array that they're doing. <clears throat> and uh, no more thumb. The thumb disappeared many eons ago, presumably. But the other thing to look at is the heart shape of the deer and the moose uh, having a, a very blocky picture, uh, blocky shape, uh, but more elongated, pointed toes. It is possible you'll come across a yearling moose and um, a bull elk, a mature bull elk, and their foot size will be the same. So that's why the, the shape, the pointiness of the track is very useful. Uh, to distinguish from the more rounded shape of the elk and the mule deer there. Okay. The moose has the most articulated uh, skeletal and muscular movement of all of those ungulates. It is able to lift that hind foot up higher than its belly line. So its feet never get in the way of, for drag, for moving through deep snow. As long as their body's not dragging, they've got those long legs that can go up over the snow with virtually no drag. Very efficient, obviously adapted to cold climates. Okay, uh, let's see. So moose tracks, I'm gonna move through this a little bit more quickly now. Uh, moose tracks moving through here again. So this track to this track, because it's direct registration, that's the body length of the animal. And it certainly surpasses any of the other hooved animals we have. Um, you can see here a bedding spot and some scats. This is where it slept overnight. First thing they do in the morning, who doesn't? Um, you uh, leave your deposit. And then over here we have uh, red osier dogwood, which is a favorite food along with willow that's been browsed both recently and for some time. Older and newer browsing sign. And here you can see sniffing hit the nose marks and it didn't like that. So I wanted, is that something I can eat? And it wasn't, so he moved on. Nose tracks. Uh, scraping the lower teeth, uh, moose, elk will to some extent too, but moose a lot. They'll scrape their teeth and get at the cambium layer underneath the outer uh, bark of aspen. This was, this was all Another clue it's moose is that in the summertime, this was nine feet above the ground. <laughs> All right, they like to feed on certain types of conifers. Down here on the lower left, we see a, limb, a lodgepole pine, and here's a lodgepole pine seedling. I call this lodgepole pine, I have to refer to that as a patui. Doesn't like that, it spit it out. But here, it likes to eat the subalpine fir. Subalpine fur, highly palatable. There's a subalpine fur used to be. There's a subalpine fur used to be there and several others. So subalpine furs, <clears throat> their main goal is to get tall enough to be above the lip line of uh, a moose because <laughs> they do favor that in the winter. So little to eat. Here you can see the, the moose went down obviously can smell a conifer under the snowpack, especially with powder, there's a lot of air in a powder snowpack. And it went down and bit off some of this conifer. This was a Douglas fir. And over here too. So this, this moose was very hungry going through and sniffing out what it could possibly eat. There again is a um, subalpine fir here. When you see a lot of beds, and it's a hooved animal, it's not gonna be moose. They generally don't congregate. If they're congregating, they're congregating while they're feeding because it's a rich forage area that they don't care that anybody else is there as long as there's enough to eat, but they're not really herding in a sense that elk will herd. This is a sign of an elk herd <clears throat> bedding down. It's on the National Elk Refuge. This was um, 23 below zero when I was out there. You can see the body heat is forming that steam coming off. They got such a nice fat layer 
uh, they're doing fine. This was in January or February on the refuge. And again, there's the tracks of the elk with that more rounded uh, or mirror of D's, mirror D's in their footprint. Maybe about uh, four inches or so in length. Spend a lot of time in the winter bedded down so you'll find their beds and they'll ruminate. They'll feed as quickly as they can and then go to a sheltered area and chew their cud. Here's some mule deer. They'll be gregarious also. They came up here and fed. A mule deer track, really nice heart shape there. Uh, let's see. Mule deer. So variable size. Here are some yearlings. Here's an adult female, an adult male. They're going to leave different size tracks, obviously. Our weasels. They turn white, like the snow. Here you can see that overstride dumbbell. There's a lens cap that the weasel left behind for us. Uh, overstride motion. So front foot, hind feet overstrides, big leap, no mark, land with the front feet, overstride the hind, big leap. And then they're hunting now. That zigzag is hunting behavior. At every corner, they stop to sniff whether to dig or not. And <clears throat> the way you can tell that is because when they're done sniffing and, and digging, and who knows, and there's another little pause over here too, uh, whether or not um, that they were moving in this direction and heard something they can hear underneath the snow. Not sure what happened to my image there. There we go. Um, they can hear and smell through the snowpack. Look at that nose, almost like a clown nose. Anyway, each, each of these points, they're sniffing. And at some point, you, if you follow this and look for this kind of behavior, this is, they're where they wanna be. They're in the kitchen, they're hunting. And it's kind of fun to seek out where they might have gone. Here's a weasel tracks going off in some shallow snow where it had been plowed. And then they went subnivian. They went under the snowpack here to get warm. Two reasons weasels are gonna go under the snow. One is to get warm, and the other is because they think or they know there's food down there. Both are important. This is a long, thin animal, very poorly adapted. It's like our fingers. We have to wear mittens. This is a poorly adapted animal to uh, winter in terms of its morphology. However, being long and thin, if you look at a weasel head on, it's the same diameter as its prey. Great adaptation. Here you can see the two by two offset in the shallower snow that becomes a barely recognizable offset. And then eventually when it's real deep, it can look like a single hole. So that can fool you. And sometimes you wanna backtrack or forward track to figure it out. But there's other signs too. It's, it's in a perfectly straight line, no left, right zigzag, even uh, uh, doable from a coyote. Here again, there's the overstriding, going inside under this log to hunt, coming back out and just, again, look at this great overstride. So here's the front foot, hind foot, and look at the leap they get before the next pair of front feet and hind feet. That's boogie. I did a cross-sectional cut. This is fun to do. So you take your shovel out with you, you find a place that's fresh tracks and where a weasel has just gone under the snow and you carve out, don't do that Bruce, you carve out, with your shovel and you, you put your shovel so it's halfway through the hole. So you're preserving it like a little ant farm, half of the hole and you can carve it out to discover as I did here, that this weasel went down and stopped right there and made a bed and slept. Came out, who knows how many hours later and continued on. It stopped there for a couple of reasons. One is they can actually find out where the hymal threshold is. It's basically the point at which it doesn't matter what the temperature above is, the snowpack is of sufficient insulated quality to make no difference. They instinctively know that depth. I have done snow measurements to look at what the, the, the uh, insulative properties and they're just, they're geniuses. Okay, so anyway, the other thing that happened here at the, a little bit farther down was a crustier snow and they wouldn't want to have to dig through that anyway. So. That was where they slept. This was a fun one. This was, <laughs> was off next near a river. And uh, let's see, I think I got an arrow. Yeah, so there, up there is track of a weasel. And 
It goes down here and leaps over the edge of that bank, plops down there, and then moves forward right up to where I was standing. Now, it had made these tracks just, I believe, less than an hour. They were extremely fresh earlier, but it was long gone. But moving along, and I followed it farther, and you can see it was going to the latrine. Here it's bounding along. This is really concentrated urine. They just spit it out because it's so thick. It's brown because they have to conserve water. So they will make as little loss of water as they can by making their, their urine semi-solid. And here's a scat dropping. I mean, as a scatologist, I was in cloud nine. I come across tracks where he did both. You know, that's pretty good. All right, anyway. Um, okay, in the weasel family, pine martens. So they're just bigger, they're, they're weasels, but they're much bigger. Uh, and they're arboreal, they climb trees. So, uh, and their tracks coming toward the camera here, you can see it's two by two offset. And in fact, after they get out of the big holes, making the big post holes, you can see the two by two offset. And coming up, it was so crusty here, they barely made any mark. They hung out on top of this little rise in the snow and then looked around and then decided to move along. You can see the five toes front and rear move along. And they're actually just walking because it's hard, it's firm. They don't have to have efficient motion, but right about here, they went to a two by two in preparation for the deeper snow, two by two offset going into the shrubs. All right, here's a one, two, one pattern. So if you ever come across a one, two, one, so it's gonna, it's, it depends, uh, dogs can do it too, but it's five toed. And so you know it's in the weasel family. And you also, if you're not sure, follow it until it goes in deeper snow and goes, uh oh, I have to slow down and you get your two by two offset. So follow the trail. Don't try to decide it here or here. Read the whole chapter. This is mink mink tracks, and uh, they're a little bit sloppier. They're two by two also though, you can see the two by two here. You can see the front foot and the hind foot uh, in their motion. So they're actually, uh, in this, they're actually, um, we're trotting along here. Uh, these are not related, I was just two different shots. But you can see both front and rear foot were together. Otters, they love to slide. Uh, what did I do? I just went backwards. All right, otters, in the, they're also in the weasel family. They're a large, uh, semi-aquatic member of the weasel family. They love on the ice to run and slide. So you can see a little slide, run, run, slide, run, run, slide, run, run, slide, run, run, slide. Uh, I don't know. I like to think they think it's fun and it's play, but it's also efficient. They're not wearing themselves out. They get to slide along the ice. Here's a place where actually earlier they had gone in fishing. Here's another one has a little pool that it keeps open to go in fishing. They'll maintain holes sometimes, even in zero or sub-zero temperatures, just by plopping into it periodically to keep it open so it doesn't freeze up. Here's that one, two, one. Here's an old set of tracks, but again, you can see here's uh, the... Uh, trotting pattern of the one, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the trotting, uh, yeah, one, two, one trot. Losing my words. Ah, this was fun. I was skiing um, at a lake once and across the lake, I could see this otter making this huge <laughs> trail here, this slot canyon, uh, bounding along. I had frightened it, even though it was, gosh, it had to be 400 yards, you know, or more. It was really a long way, but I could see, and I could see the dark body, so I knew it was an otter. Um, moving along, and it was so hell-bent on getting into its escape hole that it, it paused here briefly. Here it paused to look at me. As it turned around, its tail made its mark here to look and then say, no, I gotta get out of here. And it went in the hole. These are my ski tracks, but those tracks were not made. I was still <laughs> hustling across the lake and got these photographs 
after it was long gone. Otter will well, find dwellings <clears throat> that they've used in the summer. Um, sometimes a cavity uh, uh, could be under a log, but a lot of times it's in the bank. It's a bank den. They'll come out, and then this is their this fish scales. It's all fish remains and fish scales from their scat, and then their their footprints from the snow melt from the scat. So that's otter sign. This is another member of the uh, weasel family, but it's a badger, and badgers telltale sign here. They had dug this hole, this, this badger had dug this hole the night before, before it snowed and then it snowed and left this sign here. Uh, but you can kind of see the, uh, let's see if I have some tracks here. I can't remember if I do, but they're, tra they're any animal that's at more home underground, remember leaves really sloppy uh, tracks. And this one, oh, there it is. Pigeon toe too, a lot of drag, drag going in, drag coming out. So that's a badger going across the snow. All right, snowshoe hares. We've been looking at those before. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but there's how they make that motion. See how the, the front feet land first and then the hind feet overstride and land forward. I didn't take that picture, but I love that picture. I would love to get a picture like that. They just don't wait for me. Okay, and here you can see uh, there's two reasons a uh, snowshoe, well, there's more than two, but there's two main reasons a snowshoe hare stops and sits. So basically, it put its front feet in front of its hind feet. The only way to do that is pretty much stopping or being almost stopped and looked around and then it spun around and continued. Here you can see snowshoe hare coming forward and sniffing to see whether or not it moved forward, it reached across and sniffed that decided it wasn't palatable. So they're constantly on the look for food. Here is a dropping. So again, moving forward, front feet, hind feet past the front feet, but then the front feet going there because he had to stop. Do his thing. There you go. Oh, a little urine there too. Oh yeah. My wife and I, okay, <clears throat> don't tell her I said this, but we spent an entire day. Okay, I made her do it with me. In spring, Finding, <laughs> all, right. I don't, all right, I started, I got, <laughs> starting collecting urine and smelling it. We, we wanted to see <laughs> if we could distinguish, and boy, could we. It was remarkable, the difference. Coyote, oh man. But uh, I found the nicest uh, scat was actually, I think the Martin, it actually had a sweetness to it, uh, 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 urine. Don't tell anyone I shared this. Okay, this is just for this club we're doing here. Okay. Anyway, um, okay, that's enough about urine. <laughs> okay, here, here's a latrine. So this is a place during storms, you'll find the snowshoe hares, the rabbits in general, but snowshoe hares, they'll, they'll spend a lot of time in one place. Look at all this scat. This is more than a day's worth. They're hanging out here. It's underneath the boughs of a tree waiting out a storm. Here's where it actually ate some needles of the conifer that it was underneath. Here is where I could see the tracks. The snowshoe hare reached up, pulled down this uh, lodgepole pine and bit off pieces to feed on it, similar to this photograph here. And as you can see over here, there's more of it here. So that, I hadn't ever seen that, although I had heard that they, I know they ate needles, but reaching up and pulling it down, I thought was pretty cool. Feeding on bark, gnawing on bark gnawing all of the, look at the bark all along here has been fed upon. So it's desperation food. They need to uh, get nourishment and they'll take bark, cambium. This is another uh, <clears throat> species here. I'm not gonna talk too much about this, which is a, a jackrabbit. So the jackrabbit um, feeding in a more desert scrub kind of habitat and also feeding on buds and twigs. Jackrabbit, really lean animal long legs, but not big feet. So not well adapted to snow. It's adapted to open country, like most of Wyoming <laughs> is in fact. So there's the tracks in snow though. You'll notice that it tends to offset. It's almost like a running or galloping pattern that a coyote would leave. It offsets its hind feet and its front. Now here it didn't, but in most cases it does offset. There it didn't either when it's going slower, but when it's really cooking, it's galloping as much as it's hopping. 
That's the uh, jackrabbit. <clears throat> the white-tailed jackrabbit. Okay, and here we have some squirrel tracks uh, hopping along. They tend to leave a side-by-side -side front feet and side-by-side -side hind. The hind feet are passing the front feet, moving across. Here again, side-by-side -side front feet overstriding with the hind feet. Lens cap for scale. Uh, sometimes in the deep snow, though, they drag going in and drag coming out. And they leave what I call an H pattern. I think I showed that to you earlier. Direction of travel, you can see this squirrel was moving toward my position of the camera. The snow spray is forward. This was a very fastidious squirrel. It wasn't just throwing away the cores after it ate the cones. It was stacking them. Why? I have no idea. It's just crazy, but it's, if I may say cute, I'm going to say it. All right, here we are. This squirrel was perching here and feeding on mushrooms. How do I know? Here's a cache of mushrooms right here left behind. Feeding on mushrooms in the winter. Wearing the bark off here from perching there because it's safer and it can escape easier while it's feeding on its mushrooms. There's a close-up of the mushroom cache. You can see a couple were missing. All right, this is a ground squirrel. Ground squirrels usually, if they're not winter adapted, coming out in the uh, late winter, early spring, or even spring when there's still snow on the ground. And this, this ground squirrel sat here for so long it melted the snow, going, why did I come out so early? And then here we have uh, tracks from um, chipmunk. Chipmunk, again, uh, tree climbing hoppers side by side front feet. Ground dwelling hoppers offset front feet. Obviously these are, this chipmunk was moving toward the camera, both here and here. Mouse tracks, quarter for scale, four toes in the front, five in the back. Mouse on the deck. Mouse tracks, some old weasel tracks here that have been covered with snow and mouse tracks. So obviously predator prey habitat going on there. Tail dragging the mouse. The front feet are, the hind feet are landing in about the same place as the front feet did in the deep snow because they can't get as much of a good leap, but they are dragging their tail. And that's telltale for uh, telltale. That's probably where that comes from. Hmm. Um, here you can see using the uh, subnivian environment. So these are, mice are not winter adapted like voles are. Voles are nice and round, short tails. They're compact. Mice, long, thin, long, stupid tail. Okay, they're not well adapted to, to winter. So these mice going back and forth are using the tree well that's formed, the heat. The tree is acting as a conduit for heat from underground and and having slight vapors of warmer air around it so it melts and makes what's called a tree well. And that's what the, the mice were using to get down to the bottom where there's food. Overwintering insects, for example, are great food for mice that they're gonna find at the bottom. Mice tracks. Mice here on the right, it's a V, it's offset front feet, similar size, although there are different species of voles. This is a vole about the same size as a mouse, but offset. Why? Mice climb trees, voles don't. It's, I don't know if it's purposeful in that regard, but that is diagnostic for trackers. Feeding on, stay, this is where these voles hung out and fed on the bark and ate all the, into the cambium of this aspen tree. Uh, here you can see where some voles have, came out of a hole and moved along. Here we have tracks of a shrew. That's a penny. You can fit all four feet in almost the space of a penny, certainly a nickel. This is a galloping shrew and this is a hopping shrew. So two different forms of motion because the snow is pretty firm. All right, here we have on the left and the right mouse and in the center, a shrew for sense of scale, for size. This is a very tiny species of shrew. We have several species of shrew in our area. Mouse on the side. I don't think I'm gonna spend a lot of time on beavers. 
uh, <clears throat> I got a whole program on beavers. Perhaps I'll be invited back to do a program on beavers. Um, so anyway, but food caches, winter time, they're caching their food. They make their pile, <clears throat> they make a dam to make a pond and the pond allows them to <clears throat> pile up willow and alder and other plants that they put in a pile so heavy that it goes down to the bottom. So when it freezes over, the top part of the pile actually acts as a reverse anchor, holding the whole pile in place so currents don't pull it away. And it can go out from its <clears throat> underwater entrance out and feed off of the under ice uh, twigs that it cached in the fall. And they'll also pound their, <laughs> they'll keep holes open. They'll pound their heads uh, uh, up if it's not too thick to keep, plunge, it's called plunge holes, keep them open so they can go out. If they need, they'll do this, especially if their cache wasn't large enough, the winter was longer than expected, or they're young beavers and they didn't know enough. And they'll have to come out and find food in a much more dangerous location on shore where there's predators. <clears throat> uh, there's some beaver tracks. So here, you can tell this is an occupied beaver lodge. Get to a backlight so the sun's behind the lodge, and if you see the steam, it'll show up from the sunlight, and you know it's occupied. In fact, this tells you it's occupied too. The steam coming up is forming, it's snow making. The vapor is coming up and immediately freezing into vapor like snow making machines and falling down on the top. So that's a different, another occupied beaver lodge. And we got the porcupine, the pork out on pine. They'll feed on the, there's some scat in the center on this lower right and some feeding on bark, some bark feeding here too and some other trees. Um, they have they've, uh, do have a symbiotic relationship with forests. They open up the canopy so that the diversity of trees, sun-loving trees, can come into the newly opened uh, canopy, and you'll have more than just one species of trees, which means more than one species of all the food chain connections those trees have. <clears throat> so they are a benefit, just inconvenient to groundskeepers. Okay, we have again the pigeon toes. You can even see the claws on this left side of the porcupine. Here's where a porcupine <laughs> walked through. The snow is kind of soft and melting, and it, I'm sure at some point it got about here and looked behind. He said, "Holy mackerel!" What? He's leaving, you know, telltale tracks because its feet were muddy. This is a more typical track. You can see the tail is kind of essing its way as it ambles along. And again, the pigeon toe, very wide track, very large foot in proportion to the steps it takes. It's at home someplace other than on the ground. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Okay, <clears throat> this is not a, a bicycle handlebar. This is the rear end of a white phase, a snowshoe hare. No, I'm sorry, this is a jackrabbit. This is the white-tailed jackrabbit. And it was just in the middle of this field. I saw the red off in the distance, went out and looked at it. And there was, there were no tracks leading up to it. It was just there in the middle. And that's because we had a Northern goshawk feeding on it. And that's the species that was around there. I don't think I found sign, but it's the only species around of, of winter hawk that's gonna be uh, taking rabbits, especially jackrabbits, they're big. And where am I going now? Oh. Okay, let's see, how are we doing here? Almost at time, okay, things are, okay, good. It's good I pay attention to that once in a while. <laughs> okay, that's good. All right. Oh, now I can't, I have to click on this on it, no? There we go, okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> another favorite bird of mine, is one that caches. In the fall, it'll collect <clears throat> up to 30,000 seeds from limber pine cones. It's the Clark's Nutcracker. And it remembers where 60 to 80% of those 30,000 caches are and goes back and gets them all winter long. Bird brains, incredible. Uh, some <clears throat> grouse tracks. They kind of make that plus sign. We've talked about that already. Here's a grouse uh, coming out of its hole. They will make snow roosts. They'll go into the snow and uh, 
and roost. Here, one came out. It did some feeding here on the wild rose and then took off. You can see the wing beats taking off. Here, here's where it went in here the night before. And so it was probably like eight or 10 hours. Uh, no, I was out here maybe at seven o'clock in the morning. So maybe 12 hours or more earlier. Got inside, they reach up, they make the little snow roost on the snow and they'll make an air hole to air hole to control humidity so their feathers don't get saturated with moisture from their breathing. That's the air hole. And that's all there was. So they were, they were just, they went in, spent the night here. They came out and again emerged and before flying away, left it dropping and then took off. There's the takeoff here. <clears throat> okay, I think, uh, what do we got here? Oh, oh yeah, this, this is an owl. Look at this owl going after a mouse and it left its eyes and its beak impressed in the snow. That's cool. But you can tell it's an owl. Look at that really rounded, rounded uh, wing. I think this was also an owl. Came down, but you'll notice it came down evidently after this weasel that was right, probably right through here when it swooped in from the left and missed it and the weasel got away <sighs> weasel one owl one okay all right i'm not going to do the quiz because we're out of time but um also i can send you the quiz if you want it i think i'm just going to go through here and just okay we'll just do this come on bruce all right i want to get to my ending i'm not seeming to okay Oh uh, yeah, so I'll just quickly go through the different tracks in this scene. I came across this scene. It was just so fun to figure out who's who and who's where. Uh, same thing here. We have, uh, look at that oval track. That's a wild canid, that's a coyote. But look at this, look at that track. You can't make a canid X. It's got a double lobe there, bobcat. And this is right near a ski area. Nobody noticed it, I'm sure. And we even had a domestic dog showing up. <laughs> and that's a domestic dog. Notice how much rounder it is compared to the elongation of a wild canid. Okay. I think we're going to move on. Hopping animals. Okay, we got da -da 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 -da. a rabbit. We got a mouse. And we have a, a grouse. It's just a little quiz for you, but I'm sorry it's going too quickly. So we have hopping animals. We have the hopper here that has the offset feet, which is the snowshoe hare. And we have the hopper here, which is a tree climber, which is the tree squirrel. Here we have a little tiny little animal. Oh, okay, I guess we're starting there. Okay. Uh, this is a weasel, two by two offset, and it's prey right next here. They're in the right place. Oh, the weasel's in the right place. There's a shrew. All right, let's see how we got. All right, this is a weasel. This is a mouse. It is amazing. If you find weasel tracks, you're gonna find prey tracks because that's why the weasel's there. All right. I think now, oh, okay. Weasel, coyote. What about this one? Fatty, tree dwelling, porcupine. Okay. Oh my gosh, okay. Can I, Sarah, what time is it? I'm gonna, we I'm are. Gonna at 8.07. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> I, want to, I want to tell this story and then we'll stop. Because I came across these tracks. I first came <clears throat> across, uh, what was the previous one? Uh, okay, good, that's the one I want. Okay. This is the track here of an adult elk. This is the track here. Notice it's smaller and not sinking in as deep. As a very struggling, breathing hard, exhausted elk calf. And this is a track of a coyote who knows the smell of a, a weakened calf following up the trail. <clears throat> uh, okay, I think we already did this, we did that, we did this, yeah, right, there's the elk, there's the calf, there's this, all right, all right. Oh, I gotta do this one too, and then I'll stop, okay. <laughs> All right, this, is, this really is my last one. Okay, this, this was fun. I came across this one and I'm seeing this uh, animal track here uh, going along 
and zigzagging, and then it goes over here and goes close again and zigzagging, crossing these tracks. Why is that not working? Yeah, okay, here we go. All right, so that's a, that's a deer mouse moving along the snow. What do you think this is? Weasel. All right, so the weasel, it was not seeing the tracks. It's believed that unlike us, it used visual cues. It uh -huh. was smelling the track and going across and then realizing it overshot and going and then continuing around and then revisiting it over and over again until finally over there. And that's what I found. I found the kill site. It did find the mouse. It killed it. That's a blood spot. And there it is from a distance as it came in and then took off. Oh, it didn't kill it. It did kill it, but here it is bounding away. That's where the kill site was there, bounding away. So you can kind of see if you spend time, don't just look at a track and identify it, follow it. You're going to find stories galore, and it's most entertaining, more entertaining than most of what you're going to find on any electronic device. Just saying. Okay. How'd I do? <laughs> Sarah, what, what should I do now? Bruce, thank you so much. Um, we can we can leave it from, uh, we can take it from here. I just wanted to say one okay. thank you. Um, your okay. enthusiasm is truly contagious. Um, who here is so inclined to go outside and look for one of those weasels right now? <laughs> um, I hope so. Yeah. Um, so we really appreciate you coming out and sharing all this knowledge. Um, for those of us who live in this country, we now can go outside with a new pair of eyes. And those who tuned in from out of state today, I think are eager mm. to come out here and apply what they've learned. Um, just a reminder, we'll have part two of this event this Saturday, 10 a.m. at Falls Campground. Hope to see you all there. Please um, get in touch with us so we can register you. Um, looking forward to it. Um, and thank you so much again, Bruce. We oh, appreciate you're very welcome. Your thank you everyone for your uh, hey, Bruce. kind attention. Good job. All right. You're all right. Thank see, you. So, so see you at 10 o'clock up at uh, Falls parking lot. Try to show up a little early if you can. And uh, Kathy and Larry, hi. Um, <clears throat> hey. And we'll, um, we'll take off on snowshoes. Sarah, I'm bringing you a pair of snowshoes, right? Yes, I need one. Thank you. You bet. Fine. Okay. And we'll have a nice scenic lunch someplace. It's going to be warm. It's going to be 42 by just before lunchtime. So should be good. See you all there. All right. Have great, a good night, great everyone. Great presentation. Thank you, Bruce. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Excuse thanks me. for thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Good night, everyone.